close your eyes for a moment. Oh, by the way, Winji is a senior. Very special. Yeah. Okay, lesson 28. Pratyahara. Subject many times mentioned because of its importance. There's a reason why it appears in lesson 28 and not in lesson 1. Yoga exists out of eight limbs. The most practiced limb is, of course, asana. All the other seven limbs are mostly neglected, ignored, or even unknown. The first limb is yama, second, niyama. Then you have asana, then you have pranayama, and only then comes pratyahara. It's a very logical build-up, because those four limbs that precede pratyahara are the reason why you need pratyahara. As a result of the four limbs, Yama, Niyama, which force you to think and rethink yourself and the way that you function, which also leads to <laughs> which also leads to subconscious becoming conscious, including your practice, which leads leads to uh, asana and pranayama leads to an awakening of consciousness. So you start to question everything. But not only that, you become increasingly sensitive, increasingly conscious of things about yourself, about life in general, about your past, things that you didn't think about before, that you were not aware of before. That is a good thing. It helps you to gain not only understanding, but also a certain control over yourself and your future. But with the positive comes a negative. Or actually, I shouldn't call it a negative, because every negative in the end becomes a positive if we do the right thing with the negative. But you become aware of your pain. You become aware of traumatic experiences that you had in life when you were a child, when you were a teenager, or later on in life. There are memories that have 
influenced your behavior, that have determined your failure and successes. But you've never been able to see the connection. You've never been able to understand why. Especially why do we fail? Why, why do we suffer? As a result of your yoga practice, your increased sensitivity and consciousness, you start to become aware of the good things and the bad things. So, because this is so important, I have touched upon the subject several times already, and I mentioned that yoga practitioners who only practice but do not study the text, the philosophy of yoga, and ignore the fifth limb, Pratyahara, they end up in emotional distress. Even, I dare say, if you know about Pratyahara and its importance, its implications, even then you are not free from emotional instability, emotional suffering. Remember, energy is your capital. Without energy, there is no consciousness, there is no light. Carl Jung has also said something like that. We live in a world where emotion is considered to be an instability, an emotional instability. When you're emotional, parents, or friends or teachers, they will say, ah, you're emotionally unstable. They imply that that is a bad thing. We know that it is not a bad thing because emotion does not exist without energy. Vice versa, if you increase your levels of energy, which is responsible for all your developments, important developments, opening up of consciousness, the awakening of the, the, what we call the supernatural abilities, the cities, intuition, wisdom, vision, uh, compassion, empathy. That's impossible without energy. So we have a big dilemma here. It seems a total paradox. Yoga, after all, isn't it supposed to make us calmer, more peaceful, less emotional, and emotionally unstable? Yes, in the end. But to get there, you have to go through certain stages. It is unavoidable for a certain period of time that you are struggling with increased sensitivity and emotion. But, you're not supposed to continue suffering from it, which many yoga practitioners do, because they don't understand what is happening, and why it is happening, and more importantly, what they can do about it. And that is Pratyahara. Pratyahara is detachment. It is the most neglected subject in yoga. Not only that, if it is addressed at all, it is addressed in the same way as the yamas. Non-violence means don't kill your neighbor. Non-lying means don't lie to your teacher and your parents. With Pratyahara, they will say, detach from your earthly possessions. Detach from status and ego. Your possessions, materialism, and that's it, subject closed. We have broad nuance in all this. We know that ego is not necessarily bad. We know that a material foundation is important for the developments that yoga is presenting us. So materialism in itself is not bad. 
emotion is not bad at all on the contrary but yes it does or it can make us suffer it can make us unstable prachahara if we bring new arms into prachahara is designed to start managing what we allow to touch us it is a management technique in which you focus on things that count things that matter things that are important while at the same time ignoring and getting rid of things that are not important that are not essential that are in fact not only disturbing us but causing unhappiness uh, emotional distress and suffering now it's much easier to talk about this than to put it into practice because as part of your yoga practice you develop self-awareness self-awareness with a capital S you cannot develop self-awareness if you are confronted with memories from the past that you never thought about and then based on the subject of Pratyahara say well my teacher told me to ignore all that because it disturbs me it's not that simple and it doesn't work like that because the things that happened in the past determine who you are today who you are today the way that you function the conflicts especially that you have with people around you failures but also successes suffering in general is always a reflection of things that happened in the past so it is also important that when we are confronted with those kind of um, insights memories that hurt in the first instance that we have a look at them that we try to understand what happened why it happened and how has it affected me and how is it affecting me today now emotion which is psychological pain has a function the function is to give you a signal to draw your attention to something but because of ego we have a tendency to identify with the emotion and instead of processing the emotion in a rational way we drown in the pain and the pain perpetuates we start feeling pity for ourselves that is very human that is why the subject of Pratyahara is so important your pain your emotion is not designed to make you suffer and to continue that suffering your pain is like an alarm bell it's designed to give you insight in something what we need to do especially with memories from the past painful memories is to have a look at them honestly investigate try to understand draw conclusions we need to process so that we start building an understanding where we come from and where we want to go from now on in life in the, into the future once you have developed insights based on that memory and the pain that comes with it there must come a time that you say I know you I recognize you 
I learned from you, it's time to move on. Now that I have drawn my conclusions and developed some understanding, I don't need you anymore. Do not bother me anymore. You literally have to do that with those painful memories. In fact, in the same way that you do with hurtful people. You have to come to a point that you say, I'm done with this, I'm done with you. So when I started practicing yoga, I, I will tell you a little bit about the process. When I started practicing yoga, I, came, I became aware of memories that go back to when I was a baby, still wearing a diaper. I have memories going all the way back to, to the age of one or one and a half. I don't know exactly, of course, nobody knows, but very clear memory with the pain included. I never ever thought about those issues, experiences, trauma, traumatizing experiences, that started rising to the surface of my consciousness after starting practicing yoga. And so, in the process, throughout the years, more and more memories started to come to the surface of my consciousness. Thank you. It kept repeating itself. So, for several years, I went through that process to the point that I needed, I needed a counselor, I needed a therapist, because I couldn't process all those impressions, all these uh, perceptions. But at some point I realized this is not helpful. Because I understood better what was going on with me than the counselor or the therapist. You recognize that? And Pratyahara then became a very powerful tool, a very powerful tool to deal with all these disturbances. To the point that in the past five or ten years, I never go back to those memories anymore. Well before, it was almost, it determined my, my whole day, it determined my whole functioning. Instead of keeping myself busy with the past, I started keeping myself busy with the future. That in itself is a form of pratyahara. Diver, take away your energy from what is bothering you, and then redirect it to something of your choice. Yoga, Hapkido, coming to Korea, and everything that followed out of it. Those memories that in the past paralyzed me, almost destroyed me, they are like old friends now. Sometimes they appear once or twice a year, some memory comes up again, and it doesn't touch me anymore because immediately when it occurs it's like as if I look at it and say no more it's not important anymore but you have <laughs> if they call again I think we should answer or they destroy my car. <laughs> <laughs> so Pratyahara, Pratyahara is crucial for everybody. Even if you think you have not had any bad or traumatizing experiences in your life, it is crucial in how you deal with everything in life, with your boss, with your parents, with your partner, with, with everything. So, <clears throat> if 
first of all, of course, you have to start becoming conscious and because this has been a subject that we've been talking about from the very beginning of the course. I think you recognize your increased perception, your increased sensitivity and consciousness. As a, as a scientist, you are interested in what is happening, why it is happening, you investigate. But at the same time, you now know that it can be destructive. It can be turning into something very negative. So yoga is not designed for you to suffer. On the contrary, yoga may lead initially to more suffering because of your increased sensitivity and consciousness, but it is designed to decrease your suffering. And that's only possible if you take matters into your own hand. You have to start taking control. Yoga is the science of control also in this respect. So, let's have a look. Yeah, page one I have addressed almost everything. Um, I do see here a note about OCD, obsessive compulsive. Um, what is it? OCD, obsessive compulsive. Disorder. 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 That is when you, uh, when your increased sensitivity leads to perfectionism. Every yogi becomes a perfectionist. Being a perfectionist can be a good thing if it means that you have eye for detail. That when you clean the floor, that you also clean the corners and under the sofa and the table. Obsessive compulsive disorder means that it becomes like a disease. I once, a long time ago, um, I entered somebody's house and everything was organized perfectly. And they had a dog that was not allowed to be a dog. <laughs> because according to their perfection, perfectionist idea, the dog had to behave in a certain way, was not allowed to play or move around much. Um, in the same way they treat guests. You have, to, you have to do things like this and that. And, and when you go to the toilet, don't forget to do this and that. And, and when you drink your tea, put it back exactly where it came from. And, 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 and everything was perfectly arranged, which looks very nice, but it totally keeps you from living life. If you are born in a family like that, because that was, of course, the parents with, with a child and a dog. Um, that's hell if you, as a child, have to grow up uh, with parents who suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. Why do we talk about this? There is a danger that your increased sensitivity and consciousness leads to OCD. And at that moment, you just have to look in the mirror and just laugh at yourself. Stop being or trying to be perfect. Because, because it leads to a blockage of energy, it leads to suffering rather than that it leads to uh, a decrease of suffering or even happiness. So, I, we talked about being eccentric. Yoga practitioners become eccentric and that eccentric has a negative tone in Dutch, in English also, I think, we look down a little bit on people who are eccentric, but eccentrism actually means mindfulness. When you're mindful, you do things in a certain way. If you look at it, there is a logic. When it becomes obsessive compulsive, it's another matter. But be eccentric. When you do things mindfully, you have a logic in what you do which other people may not agree with, but that is your 
logic, that is your insight that leads you to do things like that. That is how you develop a routine, which is the foundation, basically, uh, of living life in an efficient way, or doing work also in an efficient way. Page two starts with a, um, with a paragraph touching upon um, unconditional love, basically. Um, because love is, in fact, attachment. So we talked before about unconditional love when we discussed the heart chakra. It comes back here. We don't have to elaborate too much on it. But love, most of the times, starts very wonderfully, right? Everybody who has been in a relationship has gone through the stage that you are in love, that you are with your head in the clouds, that you feel great, that you feel wonderful. When relationships consolidate, often totally the opposite happens and we don't understand why and we think that it is normal we start to fight with each other a tension occurs between the partners and sometimes relationships end because of that what is happening is that in the beginning everything is free and open but once we are committed to each other the expectations come I don't want you to talk with your friends anymore. Who were you talking to on the phone just before? I want to know. Or sending message or... And we, in all kinds of forms, we expect things from our partners that cannot be realistically fulfilled, so we become disappointed. Because when you go into the relationship, you have some kind of vision of everything that you expect from that relationship, and 99% of out of 100, that, that is not realistic, it never, it can never be fulfilled. So where it comes to prachahara is of course that you must treat the relationship at the same time being detached. That does not mean, like we talked about before, that does not mean being not committed. You're fully committed to the relationship, but you're in control of your expectations. Because if you have expectations on your partner, unrealistic expectations, or projection of your own desires and wishes, it kind of poisons the relationship. Now, of course, the relationship is give and take and compromise from both sides. But when we feel unfulfilled in our expectations without being aware that it's our projection that is disappointing us and not the partner that is disappointing us, it is, it is the reason why almost all relationships are struggling, have conflicts. So, unconditional love means that you that you keep in mind the path that your partner is on. Why? Because as a yoga practitioner, you are on a path. You are in a process, especially since you started practicing yoga. Your dharma starts to unfold. That means you have a certain direction in your life which you, which you are driven to. Because of karma, that can become interrupted because of your partner if your partner demands from you that you do not go in that direction. 
Now maybe I'm talking a little bit in riddles, but before I came to Korea, I was in a relationship with a partner who hated my dream of going to Korea. For me, it was almost like an obsession. It was something that I had to do. I really felt if I don't do it, I will regret for the rest of my life. And she, she would not accept that. So at some point, we had to separate. After seven years, we had to separate. She had, I had to force her to let me go, kind of, in a non-violent way. Just one day, she said, OK, now I see that I better start living my own life. And I said, huh, finally, <laughs> I really said, huh, finally, <laughs> you understand. Finally, you understand. finally, we get to this point where you understand that you cannot keep me from going. It is something so important for me that I'd rather die than not going. What am I saying here is that you have to have so much confidence in yourself that you can allow your partner to continue in their process of development. Which means, which means that you must be able to let your partner go. When the day comes that they need to move on in order to stay in their process of evolution, of development. Can you follow this? It's not easy. Ideal, the most ideal, is that you can walk that path together. And that is what happens when you have karma that is very similar. You have a common vision of the future and a common goal. It will not be 100% the same, but then you can be in that process of evolution, of growth and development. You become one, basically. That is the ideal, that is what Ajita used to call the marriage, the marriage in heaven. So that is not the marriage at the city hall where you sign a paper. It is the true fusion of two souls coming together. And frankly, in most relationships, that fusion is lacking. Because we don't connect with each other soul to soul. We are too busy with the material aspects of our relationship with our lower expectations and desires. So in that respect, Pratyahara is also very important. As a human being, every human being, you will be confronted with those expectations that you project onto your partner or your partner upon you. You will be confronted with disappointments. But as a yogi, that does not happen subconscious anymore or instinctive anymore. Next time when it happens, you take a moment for yourself and you ask yourself, what is happening here? And what do I remember about this? What do I remember about Pratyahara? What, what am I supposed to do with this situation? It doesn't feel good. I don't want to have conflict. So how should I handle this best? And in that case, you will come to the conclusion that indeed you are too much attached to your partner based on ego, based on, on expectation. And there you have to take a step back. This is very difficult, one of the most difficult things to do. But the one thing that you have as an advantage compared to before or compared to other people is you are conscious of what is happening. And that will allow you to steer it in the right direction, to take control. But it means overcoming your ego, always coming back to ego. It means overcoming your fears, because lots of expectations are connected with fears. Fears about the future, fears about what your partner is doing, fears about losing your partner, fears about being betrayed and what have you. The alternative is that you continue your relationship in a normal way, and what really happens is you put each other in a prison. And that is the condition most relationships actually are in.
The fourth paragraph is very important. I kind of used it in the introduction of the subject, but it is actually really about blame and guilt. One of the biggest emotional distresses that we experience is blame and guilt, self-blame. Things that happened in the past that when you think of it, you cringe. You're horrified with, with the misery that you have caused in your ignorance to people that you love, that, but, but actually hurt. Feeling guilty about things that happened in the past, like emotion, should only be a signal an alarm bell. If you interpret it as an alarm bell, you will learn from it not to behave like that in the future. The reason why we make mistakes is not evil intent. The reason why we make mistakes is because we are ignorant. It's our inexperience. So if you are honest about it, you draw conclusions and you try to avoid doing it again in the future. And that's all you can do. Continuing to feel guilt about something that happened in the past. Something that you did or said to your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad. That was very hurtful. Continuing to feel guilt about that is not constructive. It's not helpful at all. Move on but learn from it. Allow that memory to make you a better human being from that moment on. Regret is the opposite. It's not what other people did, it's what we did in the past. No? Am I turning it around now? Guilt is feeling bad about things that we did ourselves in the past. We can also feel very sad about things that people did to us. So we feel anger, maybe even hatred. Emotions that poison us from inside and lead us also often to commit acts to other people who've never done anything wrong to us that are just as bad as the things that other people have done to us. How do you deal with that? In the same way as you deal with yourself. I feel guilt because I did something wrong, but it happened because I was ignorant. I was, I didn't know, I didn't, I was foolish, I was stupid, but now I know. I will try to avoid it. People who treated you bad in the past, who, who hurt you in the past, you treat in the same way. Because what they did, they did out of ignorance. And they also have a right to become a better human being as a result of, of that mistake. Blame and guilt is human, but you should, you should not drown in it like many of us do. It is because of ego that we keep holding on to those emotions. But what we really do is we harm ourselves and we block ourselves from moving on and growing and developing into something that we really want to be in the future. It is human to stay stuck, but for a yogi, we using pratyahara, detaching ourselves, distancing ourselves, using our rational thought, we create room to evolve, to grow, to move on, to leave behind those things that caused, that caused pain.
Can you follow this? Can you see how incredibly important this is? Everybody is dealing with this. And worse, everybody is suffering, miserable because of this. Either we are filled with self-hatred because the things that we did out of ignorance, or we are filled with hatred towards other people because of what other people did out of ignorance. And even worse, we are filled with both self-hatred and hatred towards other, others. There is no end to it if you don't take control of it. So it concludes with the warrior, which all of you are becoming. Many people who, there are many people who kind of reject yoga as being something new age, something for hippies, something for weak people. And they have no idea. I've had such people coming to class to try it out. And they are shocked by how difficult it is. And they never come back. <laughs> I think I've mentioned before the word jihad. Jihad is, a, is an Arab word that terrorists use to justify killing people. Jihad. If you follow the news about terrorist acts, what is happening in Syria with ISIS or Daesh, with Al Qaeda who blew up the World Trade Center in New York in 2001, the word jihad ferry comes up. Jihad is a struggle in which you don't kill other people, but in which you fight your internal demons. That is the real warrior. It is weak. It is weak to kill somebody else because of the struggle that you are having. Can you see? So these people use bombs and Kalashnikovs, they murder other people, often in very torturous ways, innocent people, and their excuse is, this is our holy war. Yoga philosophy has a book this big, it's called the Bhagavad Gita, that's about this holy war that is not limited to Islam, because every person in this world, regardless of your culture, your nationality, every person who as a result of your process of becoming conscious, you will have this internal battle. That is something that you have to solve yourself, not by killing and blowing up other people. The Bhagavad Gita is a book on the surface, because it is written in symbolical language, just like the Islam, the Quran, is written in symbolical language. The book seems to describe a real war, a battlefield, with chariots and fire and arrows and, and spears and people cutting each other's throats with, with swords and knives. If you read between the lines, it is no such thing. It is not a physical battle with weapons 
and people dying. <clears throat> In the Bhagavad Gita you have Arjuna, which is who is a warrior, who every time when he is facing a dilemma, a conflict, he goes to his advisor, Krishna, and Krishna gives him insight, not how to kill people, but how to deal with his own demons. So it's an internal struggle, not an external struggle. It's a big problem in the world. The news on a daily basis is dominated by this struggle. That is the reason why I refer to yogis as warriors. Because the real warrior is the warrior in the spirit. That is much more difficult and therefore much more courageous than to just kill somebody else thinking that you are dealing with your struggles. Can you see that? So yoga is not for weak-hearted people. On the contrary, it's only the courageous people that have the courage that dare to expose themselves to something like this leading to that internal war. In the Bhagavad Gita, that battlefield is called the Kurukshetra. The Kurukshetra is the battle between the head and the heart. It helps you to navigate the minefield that the world is, where you have conflicting interests. The mind is telling you this based on calculation and rationalization, while the heart is telling you something else. Then people often ask me, how do I know what is the head and what is the heart? And that's something you can only find out by experience. When you are dealing with a dilemma and you have conflicting solutions and you don't know which one comes from the head, which you know often leads to more suffering, leads to more conflict, or the heart, which rises above ego and self-interest, and often leads to diminishing of struggling and suffering. If you don't know, if you're not sure, you simply have to choose. Pick one and put it into practice. If it goes wrong, you have learned a new lesson and you can try again. So don't be afraid to experiment. If you have conflicting ideas between the head and the heart and you don't know yet which one is the right one, you simply have to try. And based on trial and error, you will grow. And based on experience further down the road, you become more skillful at determining which voice is the heart and which voice is the mind. That is how you learn to distinguish in this battle between the head and the heart. So not easy, but the only way to deal with it is simply putting it into practice and dare, dare to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. But also don't be afraid to admit having made a mistake and move on. And sometimes that involves that we need to apologize if we were wrong. Ego usually is the biggest obstacle that we are dealing with in this whole battle. Let's conclude with the final 
sentence in the in the last paragraph. Do your very best, but do not pursue perfection. Be laconic. Do you understand laconic? Laconic is an English word for maintaining a laid-back attitude. Do not do not get upset. Do not do not become frantic in your pursuit of what you are learning here. Stay calm, do not get upset, and try to deal with it as efficiently as possible. But always keep your yamas and niyamas in mind. Your need to detach should not lead to violence or to denying other people there the, the process that they are in, especially when you talk about relationships, not only uh, relationship from, from partner to partner, but also relationships with, with family, mom and dad, other siblings. The most people that I know when we talk about family, I only hear stories about conflict. Conflict with the parents, conflict with other siblings, I'm very blessed with my family. We have no conflict at all. I can honestly say we have no conflict at all. Strange. Because the way that we started 50 years ago, there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of upheaval and trauma. And maybe that is the reason. We're so sick and tired of all the conflict and, and suffering and misery. My family, without ever having studied yoga, the moment that a conflict is not even, it's, it's still in the butt, it's, there is the potential, the essence, the essence of a conflict is starting to grow. It's nipped in the butt. And we're very united in that. Without, if I, if I tell this, what I'm telling you to my family, they will say, Oh, what are you talking about? It's just, <laughs> it has become second nature to do that. I've noticed this very consciously because I have a sister-in-law who's totally the opposite and always tries to stoke conflict. She doesn't get a chance. She never gets a chance to make people upset or create conflict between other siblings or with our mom. We just don't let her. We just, we just mow the grass in front of her. She has no, no food to stand on. I, I don't know how you say that in English. She just, she tries all the time, still, after all those years, she never, always fails. That, that is really poisonous, a person like that in your family. But all families have these people. In my family, it doesn't work. I'm very, and yet we are also very detached. I've, been, I've, I've not been back to Holland for the past nine years. And nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> Including me. <laughs> I would like to go back. My mom is getting old. Sometimes one of my sisters asks me, but for the rest, nobody cares. We love each other just the same. We don't need necessarily to, to see each other face to face. Detached. And yet, we love each other dearly. Strange, huh? Sounds like a paradox. Yoga is a paradox. The science of yoga is a paradox. Why? Because it's about balance. It's between plus and minus. That is why many things in yoga seem to be contradicting but they are, in fact, inevitable to eventually come to sattva, to harmony. Questions? Questions will come later, I'm pretty sure. Everybody is dealing with issues internally, also at the workplace, at home, Do not hesitate to ask if something comes up. 
Okay, let's have a short break.